everyone. Welcome to the Plant Based Morning Show. I am Doug Hay. I'm joined today by Isabel. Matt Frazier. I'm Matt Frazier. Not, not Matt Frazier. <laughs> no, Matt's off, I don't know, uh, out of soccer game, maybe. Gallivanting the world. a new sound machine. I don't, uh, it's hard, hard to know where Matt is, but he's not here. He did prep today's show notes, though, so I am, uh, I am grateful for that. We have a really good show. We're going to be talking about uh, Slutty Vegan. We have some Slutty Vegan news. We have uh, cafeterias, college cafeterias going vegan, people not wanting to look at the animals they're about to eat, plastic bags, and whether or not the impossible meat is actually vegan. So it's going to be a fun, mm-hmm. it's gonna be a fun show, um, and uh, we're glad you're here. Garuda's here. Good morning, Garuda. Lady draws a lot. Uh, we'll let a few people trickle in before we get too deep into this. But uh, Isabel, how, how, have you, how have you been? Did you have a good weekend? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was nice and sunny after some snow here, so we got to spend lots of good time outside, which is always always my favorite. I did yoga out on my deck, and it oh. was it was the best decision that I that I made on Saturday was to do that. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, You're, so, I mean, because a couple of days ago or a week ago, you were had like three feet of snow, right? Yeah, yeah. So we we finally shoveled it. There was probably a foot left on the deck, and we finally shoveled it all off. And then it was beautiful and sunny. I live in Colorado, and when when it's sunny out, snow goes away in like two seconds. So yeah, <laughs> being able to be out after that was was really nice. Awesome. Yeah, I had the I had the girls solo again uh, last weekend, which we talked about on the Friday show a little bit. But yeah. um, we went roller skating. Super fun. I don't know. Had you ever go? Have you ever been roller skating in like thirty years? Uh, I, I was going to say, have I ever been? Yes. In the recent history, I think it's probably been like f- maybe like five years. My, I have a niece. And so I've, I've gone roller okay. skating with her, right. but it's been, it's been a long time, but that was my jam growing up. Like we, that's oh, what yeah. we did for everything. We went roller skating and I, I, as an adult, you forget all about it. Yeah. I mean, there's this yeah, old classic it? roller rink that uh, is not too far, you know, maybe like 20 minutes from our house that, um, you know, just, it's like total nostalgia in there. Oh yeah. Same strobe lights and disco balls and uh, music and, you know, like really bad, uh, you know, place to get food and concession (laughs) stands and stuff. I don't know. Even even the skates are probably 30 years old, but uh, but it's really fun. It's it's really fun. Yeah. That's a, that's a great choice too, for entertaining the kiddos. Uh, Good job, daddy. (laughs) Thanks. All right, uh, we got some more people trickling in here. Katie, Britters, um, welcome everyone. And uh, any food news? I mean, I don't know. We were killing a little time here before, <laughs> the show, before we jump into the weather report. Any, well, I don't know. Any, I'm, I'm really excited about this uh, this university one that we're going to be talking about because I don't know if you I don't know if you know and or remember this, but I used to work in residence halls and worked with dining for yeah. for a long time for like ten years. So this one hits home for me, and I'm really excited to talk about. It. All right. Well, should we just jump into it? Should we just jump right into the weather report? I think so. Let's do this. Don't have the sound machine, so you got to see. All right. First up, uh, Slutty Vegan News. The vegan burger chain backed by celebrities and spearheaded by Pinky Cole Hayes has opened its doors to its 14th establishment in the heart of West Village, New York on 7th Street, uh, spanning across uh, 1,870 square feet. It's uh, it's gonna be a big one, and what oh. they are, um, the the new location will have the same vibes as the slutty vegan stores, except we plan to shine light and celebrate the LGBTQIA plus communities and pride. And then uh, one thing they call out is they're already serving breakfast, which is like their Atlanta mm. Edgewood site. You haven't been to a slutty, slutty vegan, have you? I have not. No. Uh- <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I also have my little one who's oh, hanging no out with us today. Um, I have not, and I uh, I'm really excited about the sounds of this new store. But have you been? I have. I have. Yeah, been. yeah. I went to one in in Atlanta. Um, it was great. It was really, you know, it was like, you know, greasy, sloppy vegan food, but it, it was awesome. And the vibe there was incredible. Everyone was just so happy to be there, and they appear to be happy to be serving me food. I have no idea how true that is, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I very much enjoyed it. I thought it was great. It gave the appearance of it. Yeah. And I didn't realize they had 14 or 13 other locations. So that's, that's. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't either. I thought it was more of a like two to three chain, but that's really cool. Very exciting. Yeah. All right. So, and now to the, um, to the well-teased Sodexo news. 
U.S. Sodexo USA recently announced that it it has massively expanded the use of default bed strategy. Their default bed strategy in a university dining hall in university dining halls. This strategy, which was first piloted by Sodexo in collaboration with Better Food Foundation and the Food for Climate League in university canteens with all-you-can-eat offerings, uses behavioral incentives to encourage plant-based dietary change. Um, basically, mm -hmm. what's happening here is that they're defaulting veg, and then you can add in the meat or you can add in uh, non-vegan options. But I, I got to say, this is like, I think that this is how more people will eat plant-based foods, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. And I think it's a, it's an easy, especially in the, like the college and university setting, it's an easy in, like when you're in a dining hall with all of these different food options and just to like, to have the dedicated section is like, that's huge because then at least people will like go and look at it instead of it being like special preferences section over here. Um, yeah. it's, it's really, it's really exciting that they're doing this. Yeah, I think, I think it's great. And what, uh, what is, I don't know. I mean, because right, it's not going to piss anybody or like piss as many people off if if, if it had gone fully veg or something like that. You know, yeah. having the meat options, of course, allows people to choose what they want, but the defaults veg. We there was um, lots of news out of the New York City hospitals last year or two years ago, maybe went uh, they went default veg. So um, when you ordered your food or whatever, the first option to pop up or like the veg, the first available option was a plant based meal, um, and they found that it completely changed behavior in what people are ordering because that those meals were always there. You could always get the vegan option, but no one was doing it. And then a lot of people chose that just, uh, just because, you know, it was presented in a way that made it feel like the better option. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't know. I, th I think this is a really good move for anyone who is trying to encourage more plant-based foods without going fully plant-based to do something like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Again, like college and university age students, traditionally 18 to 22, like that's a pretty formative time in life to be able oh, yeah. to mm -hmm. start exploring things that maybe you've never explored before. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So they, uh, a little bit more on this, separate from the pilot program produced by Food Climate League and Better Food Foundation, um, suggests even greater potential benefits in institutions that consistently follow the strategy. In this report, it was calculated that the two universities that most consistently implemented implemented plant-based meal strategy during the pilot program saw a staggering 150% increase in plant-based meal choices, resulting in up to 81.5% of students choosing plant-based meals. Um, and then also a 23.6% decrease in greenhouse gas admissions attributed to catering in the three schools. And the concept is now firmly integrated into menus of Sodexo canteens in almost 400 universities and colleges across the United States. There you go. That's awesome. Yeah. Yep. All right. Next up for the April two April 2024 cover story of Vanity Fair, the actress. Oh wait, the actress spoke to with reporter Julie Miller. Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway. Okay, Anne here we Hathaway. go. Anne Hathaway spoke to reporter Ju Julie Miller at a plant-based restaurant, prompting her to hilariously admit something about herself. And this is, uh, this is from people.com, so I don't know how hilarious it actually is, but uh, here we go. Uh, the quote is, I think everybody can agree I have a personality of a vegan, as she quipped over eating green chickpea hummus and honey nut squash. Sounds good. Yummy. Uh, what, what, yeah. Do you think Anne Hathaway has the personality of a vegan? I don't really know what that's yeah, supposed to mean exactly. I know. So. Um, but it turns out she's not vegan. She just likes vegetables. She hasn't given up meat, although she does love vegetables. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is a bad though she does love vegetables. I die over beets, says Vanity Fair. But other than uh, the past five years, she has, but she has given up alcohol. Okay, all right. So this is not really a vegan story. <laughs> <laughs> They're just throwing it in there for for people to take a look at. Mm -hmm. Buzzword, everybody. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think it's funny when people are like trying to relate with a vegan because they like vegetables. I mean, who, aside unless you're a carnivore, like who doesn't like at least some sort of vegetable? Yeah. Who doesn't like beets? Beets are delicious. Yeah. Well, delicious. beets actually are kind of a special taste, but beets are delicious. I mean, they're so good. Roasted beets, I can oh, eat yeah. that all day. Pickled beets? Oh, yeah. Pickled beets? But it is, it is, just like you said. Like it's, oh, I like vegetables. It's like, oh, you're vegan? Oh, I like vegetables too. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, uh, let's see here. 
on to the next one. People who eat meat prefer not to see animals. Well, wow, this is this is uh, breaking news here. Actually, I think it is. I think it's important news to, to to talk about here. People who eat meat prefer not to see animals. They are eating on product labels. A new study by the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board (AHD). B has found in the study nearly two thirds of meat eaters found food imagery more appealing for pork products than pictures of pigs. So I guess that's like pictures of bacon or, or whatever it is you're eating instead of an actual pig. The AD, A, the AHDB is part of the UK government department of for environment, food and rural affairs. And earlier this year, campaigners accused the body of misleading customers with its pro meat adverts and supermarkets. The AHDB says that volume growth in the fresh red meat has been challenging for many years. Indeed, the total number of pigs slaughtered for meat in the United in the United Kingdom fell to 10 million in 2023, the lowest number since 2013. Wow. So, I mean, the news here is that people don't want to see the animal that they're about to eat uh, on the label, which is is unsurprising, but. Um, but what is important for our motivations, <laughs> our motives, is uh, is to just you know make sure that people understand, or or I don't know, being like not hide from the fact that people are eating animals, right? And they don't have to see the slaughter, yeah. animals, right? They don't have to see all the gruesome, um, to, you know, what's actually happening back there. But just just reminding someone that like that's an animal. I mean, I'm not going to go around telling people like, "Oh, how's that cow you're eating?" You know, but like, yeah, yeah. But that, that's the, that is powerful in ads or in stuff that we do, or whatever. You know, showing that it really is a, an animal and not just a style of meat. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do think it's really interesting to think about, um, you know, the the impact that that has, like the psychology of oh, I'm eating this thing versus like oh, I I like see the animal that I am eating. That, that I mean, that is a big difference. I wonder if we you know, if, if they printed more animals on food packages, like would that actually deter people more? I don't, I'm not saying that's yeah. a good idea, but I, th I do think it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting study that they did. Makes yeah. sense, but what they I've could always, do with it. Hmm. I've always been struck by how many like barbecue places have a, like a cartoon pig in their logo or, or like Chick-fil-A, you know, uses the cartoon cow. It's like eat more chicken. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just like a lot. I just, it, it, it blows my mind how many restaurants kind of lean into the fact that like the animal that you're about to eat. I don't know. I mean, I guess with, yeah. I get, I, I wonder how a chick, it works for Chick-fil-A when they're talking about a cow instead of a chicken. And it's, I was going to say, and it's not chicken. That is, that is interesting. I wonder what kind of research Chick-fil-A has done. We should find out. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All right, now shifting away from uh, plant-based foods, but into popular plastic sandwich bags. A new analysis of the most popular plastic sandwich bags found that the vast majority came, contained toxic PFSAs, also known as forever chemicals. The analysis, which ha was commissioned by the Mamavation blog, interesting, and carried out by the yeah. EPA certified lab, found that uh, nine out of 11, 81% of the most popular san sandwich bags showed high levels of PFSAs. Is that, is that a, should you say it? P -s <laughs> P -s I don't, I don't think so. PFAS. <laughs> PFAS. Oh, there you go. That sounds right. Um, and while the USDA allows for much higher levels of indi individual PFAS in plastic uh, packaging than those found in, uh, than those found in the new analysis, the F the EDF um, told the Guardian that the FDA is still basing regulations on outdated science. So uh, you're not here with us, but um, plastic, you know, forever chemicals in your plastic sandwich bags that you're probably putting, uh, a lot of people are putting their kids' sandwiches in, uh, lots of little snacks. You know, we have sandwich bags, we, uh, that you know, that we use plastic sandwich bags. I use them a lot for running, actually. It's like, if I'm going to, be putting pretzels or something in my running bag. I don't want to carry a big silicone plastic sandwich bag um, that, uh, you know, that we use for the kids' lunches. We have the silicone bags, maybe seen them. Yep, um, yep, they're great. They're, but they're not great for, like, stuffing into a running bag. So I often use yeah. the plastic. 
the plastic ones and either just rinse them or sometimes throw them out. And um, I don't know. I don't know. Does this freak you out? Does forever chemicals freak you out? I will, I will say, yeah, it, it does. I'm not a big fan of plastic bags in general. Like I always, I always want to look for the like multi-use and then I am that person that washes out the bags <laughs> every time I use them uh -huh. so that I can yeah. use them multiple times. So yeah, this does like, this does kind of freak me out. Like what happens when I'm washing these? But this kind of study is one that I'm like, okay, now I want to go look at what brands don't have that. Yeah. Because I, 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 I use the silicone baggies. I use containers almost all of the time and instead, but I do exactly like you're talking about. I use either baggies or sometimes even plastic wrap, which I don't like that I use, but I do. Mm -hmm. I use plastic wrap sometimes to like put snackies in for, for running too. So that is a, that is a solution I need too. Yeah, I mean they're uh, they're convenient, no doubt about it. Uh, Garuda says get glassware, and of course, like I, we use glass silverware all the time. But um, you, know, you can't really take that on the trail. Can, like, take a okay. yeah. yeah, giant glass Tupperware around. <laughs> yeah. Those silicone bags, I, and I have no idea, honestly, if they're any better. Like well, there might be forever chemicals in those too. That's no, true. Like, I don't. I don't know either. Better for the environment, I assume. In in my head, they are because uh, they're reusable. But who knows what it takes to produce them. Um, but they're not going in the landfill. Yeah, that's the next thing that we need to create, Doug. You, you and me, we'll create some sort of runner solution. Yeah, there you go. Who knows? I like it. All right, that's your weather report, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, <laughs> Chick -fil uh, Britter says Chick-fil-A just announced they are going to start using chicken with antibiotics again. Interesting. Uh, I wonder what that's about. Uh, and then Britter, or River Cat says that she saw that I guess their audience doesn't really care. I would imagine that's probably show true. Probably true. Um, and then Gruda says Chick-fil-A is my jam. There you go, Gruda. All right. Um, so our big main article of the day is about impossible burgers and whether we test or whether <laughs> impossible burgers being tested on animals. And does that make them vegan or not? Are they no longer vegan? Yikes. So, so, so here we go. All right. This is an article from Plant-Based News titled, is, it, is the Impossible Burger Vegan? The Debate Explained. So I think that, that like, I saw a couple reels about this um, last week. So I don't know if this is just breaking news or, uh, like, that they tested some stuff on animals or not. But um, it seems to be picking up some steam here. The, yeah. the, the gist is that Impossible Foods which of course is the producer of impossible meats and also impossible chicken and all kinds of impossible things that, um, all right, let's see if I can find it here. Um, <laughs> that they, they tested on, on mice. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Well, the very, very limits to what they had to do essentially for, for FDA approval is what mm -hmm. is how I read it is what they did in order to gain the FDA's approval. That's right. Here we go. In order to gain full approval from the U.S. FDA and to be generally recognized as safe, or GRAS, uh, they had to test on on mice. They had to test their um, their what is it, heme protein something. Yeah, their their special heme protein. Um, so does that make them not vegan? Uh, you know, and talks about what does it mean to actually be vegan? By definition, vegans avoid all products that cause or are derived from animal exploitation. This includes milk, dairy, eggs, along with meat and any other animal derived ingredients. But this ethos also extends to textiles like leather and any other products that have been tested on animals from cosmetics to food ingredients like Impossible's heme. I don't know, what's your take? What's your take, Isabel? Does this mean Impossible Burgers are actually not vegan? Sorry, everybody, little guy is coming to join us. This is a this is a really difficult one, I think. Um, one, like I think it obviously <clears throat> it it depends on your definition of vegan. Like they obviously give a definition, um, but I think there's lots of different ways that people you know define this word. I don't know. I I think it might mean that it's not vegan because of the connection to animal testing. It's it's plant based certainly still, but mm -hmm. I think the the like real hardcore vegans would say, well because they, because they did this animal testing, but I, I thought it was really interesting that, and I don't, I don't know what the US FDA's requirements 
are. Um, but I found it really interesting that like that was a portion of their testing was that they that they they had to do this testing on animals, which mm. that brings up a whole nother question in of itself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It does. Uh, and I mean, you can't fault a company if that's their only way to go to mass market. Like, is it better for them to test on the minimum? They, they said they tested on the minimum required of mice. Is it better to do that one time? And they haven't done it since. Um, just so they can bring plant-based meat to market, which I'm sure has saved more animals than uh, than been uh, tested on. Um, you know, is that is that better, or is it better to just not have anything that is going to be required to be tested? I, you know, I would I would say that uh, this is it's better for them to bring it to market, and and you got to do what you got to do within reason, of course, uh, to be able to do that. But I understand also that you know. People might not agree with that, and that's fine. Uh, it says, um, keep in mind, it's worth, it, this is quoting now plant-based news, it's worth bearing in mind, however, that the definition of veganism is avoiding animal exploitation, quote, as far as possible and practical. Many ingredients we have, um, in many ingredients we eat have impacted animals in some way, and avoiding them is extremely rare. Everything from life-saving medicines to diapers to contact lenses may have uh, maybe implicated in animal testing. And that's right. I mean, I, like, mm -hmm. I'm sure that there are so many things I use and touch and wear every single day how it can be linked back to some sort of animal testing. And um, it'd be impossible, I think. You know, I mean, I'm sure that there are people who do it, you know, so I guess I can't say impossible, but mm -hmm. it'd be, um, it would be very impractical, I think, for me at this mm -hmm. phase of my life to, to fully mm -hmm. remove any sort of animal testing anything that's been animal testing for my life tested for my life that said yeah. like if if i like shampoo you know or some sort of cosmetics or something like that if i know that there's an option that hasn't been animal tested of course i'm going to choose that one um but yeah i don't know what do you, what do you think no, no I, I i agree with you 100 percent. like i you know i just just like looking around my house i'm like did i make sure that every single thing in here you know had no had no connection to animal testing the answer is no like that is not that I didn't go that deep that, as you said, there are people that, that do. And like, that's fantastic. I, I love that. I'm really glad that there are those people yeah. in the world, but I also think it's really like, I think it's really great that impossible has been upfront about this. Again, I don't know if it's breaking news. Like they're just telling the world now, or if they've always been, they have always been open about it, but, but you know, I, I think it's important that they, that they have never called their product vegan. Like that's not a word that they've mm -hmm. used on it. It's always been a plant-based meat or plant-based protein. Um, so I don't think that they've claimed to be anything that they're not. Um, and I agree. Like they, I think they did it in probably the most sustainable way and ethical way that they could. And, and I'm, I'm a proponent of impossible. So I, I believe that mm. what they're saying. Um, but I agree with you that like, would it have been better if they had never done this and never brought it to market? No, I don't think so. Because yeah. I think it's it's expanding the minds of, you know, people who are plant plant curious um, and who who try it out, and that's that's better in my mind than you know not having that in in the world. Um, have you? Would you uh, like if Beyond didn't you do animal testing? And I have no idea. Um, the fact that we're not talking about it here in this article, I think that they didn't. Or they might not have mm -hmm. their own. They might not. They don't have, have the. They don't have the heme protein. Yeah, that's yeah. that's like impossible's thing. So does that change your mind? Like, would you now choose Beyond, like in a store instead of Impossible, if you're if you have the option? That's a really good question. Mm. Not not important to you. Though. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I, I've I've talked about this before. I use the like the plant based meats kind of pretty sparingly in in our diet. Like they're not the thing that mm -hmm. I reach for first. Um, but I don't know. I I to be honest, I think I think I probably would. Like if I had the choice, if it was like yeah. the same price, same thing that I was looking for, I probably I personally probably would choose Beyond over. Yeah, I think I would knowing, too. knowing this. Yeah, yeah. How about you? Yeah. I think I think I would too. And you know the other thing that the, this article calls out is that. They've never, uh, and you mentioned this too, they've never called themselves vegan. They always refer to themselves as plant-based, uh, which is true and and fits here, of course, um, you know, the definition of vegan and would, you know, might piss people off even more if uh, if they did use the term vegan. 
But I, I gotta say, I gotta assume that that was more of a marketing decision to uh, to avoid vegan yeah. and being associated as like a vegan meat um, than uh, than any concern mm. around um, around the animal testing. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think probably too. Um, but but I still like I still like the fact that they haven't claimed to be vegan. I do think that's still helpful in my really? mind, at least. It, okay. Maybe not for other people, but I think so. So uh, Gruder here says and uh, says that they have been open about testing on mice from the beginning, and they said that they would have not done it if they could have avoided it. Yeah, uh, they yeah. said that in this article as well. Um, and Kate says I would guess that a lot of people don't even realize testing was required. Including myself, I didn't. This is this was yeah, new to I didn't me know that when either. I uh, when I first heard about this just a couple of days ago. Um, well, interesting, very interesting. I want. I'm curious if this would change anyone who's watching buyer behavior at all. Yeah, I would. I would love to know as well what the what the people think. Because yeah, I, I had never considered it either until you asked me the question, Doug. Of of would it change? Would it change my behavior? And I think so, but I, but I don't think it's printed on the packaging anywhere. Maybe it is where it says like, I don't know. I, I now I need animals. to look at the packaging. Yeah, tested on animals. Mm -hmm. I don't know why you would advertise that. Because <laughs> well, I, mean, I, if it's FDA, I don't know if they if they have to. Yeah. I'm gonna look now next time I'm. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. I think I have some Impossible chicken in my in my freezer. Take a look for us, Doug. All right, so we got some extra time here, so I think we, we move on to one additional article. Um, this one from Veg News, and the title is How Netflix is Driving the Plant-Based Shift, a Timeline. And uh, over the past decade, Netflix has hosted a number of impactful films and series that have changed the way many of us think, eat, and behave. And that is, I mean, just incredibly true. There are some, mm -hmm. some ne uh, documentaries that came from Netflix that became popular on Netflix that really have impacted uh, the conversation around food and a plant-based diet um, and had, you know, I mean, there were times when it was, you know, uh, you would hear a lot of people talking about it, like, how did you see Forks Over Nice? Did you see that movie? And, uh, and, you know, and they were not connected to the plant-based diet at all, uh, but watched the movie and, and that probably had a lasting impact. Uh, what's interesting is that we get further down this timeline, it uh, I think the impact is smaller and smaller. And I'm not sure if that's just because uh, the films weren't as good, um, or you know, as impactful themselves, or if um, if people are just kind of over the, you know, they, they've they've watched Forks Over Nine six years ago and now are are no longer interested in the conversation. But so if you go through the timeline here, it starts in 2013. Blackfish exposes Sea World, causing profits to plummet. I never watched this movie. Did you watch Blackfish? Yeah, it was it and it, I feel like it was like groundbreaking at the point in time when it came out and it is um yeah, it is it was fascinating. And I I do think this was kind of like the start of these bigger hitting movies that Netflix started or or documentaries that Netflix started um hosting. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, according to this Fetch News article, as a result of the film's release, SeaWorld's stock prices plummeted, ticket sales fail, sales fell, and a major travel in a, sorry, and major travel companies pulled their partnerships with the theme park. Yeah, um, but the eighteen orcas still remain in SeaWorld's parks. Uh, but they they announced an end to the orca breeding program in twenty fifteen. Uh, so yeah, that's something making change. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, moving on to the timeline, 2015 cowspiracy showcases the shocking truths about animal agriculture's environmental impact. This one, you know, this one got started a lot of conversations. I think, I don't know how many people had actually, um, converted to, you know, eating to a plant-based diet or, or, um, maybe even, even caused them to eat less meat. You know, I think that it, but it got people thinking about or associating animal products and meat in general with uh, with harming the environment. Mm -hmm. I think there's there's been a couple of these, though, over probably the last, I don't know, like 15, 20 years. It's like I feel like every couple of years there's like one big documentary about mm -hmm. like animal farming or, you know, these mm -hmm. these environments that we're raising animals in. But uh, again it's cyclical like it's like really exciting and like shocking and i feel like makes people think about their behavior and then it kind of dwindles off and then we have another one that happens. yeah right 
Right. It's interesting. <clears throat> so, yeah. And so that was 2015. And the next year, very next year, Forks Over Knives discloses the link between diet and disease. And I think this one probably was the first to break through in a huge way. Uh, and I might be wrong about that, but um, in with associating plant-based diet, uh, especially a whole food plant-based diet with uh, longevity and mm -hmm. the health impact. Um, so th this article goes on to say, Forks Over Knives introduced the general public to the idea that food wasn't just some modest force. Um, and uh, it was going to to bring your cholesterol down a little bit or something like that. It wasn't going to bring your cholesterol down a little bit or something like that. It was something revolutionary that could empower you to change your life dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's true. I think that Forks Server Knives had a really big impact on people. I think I think so too. And I think it was it I maybe I'm wrong in saying this, but I feel like it's what like main it almost turned it mainstream to be able to talk about yeah. plant based diets and, and veganism, I think. Yeah. And I Netflix is in, is incredible for their like choice of these different mm -hmm. documentaries. And I feel like it really has been. Um I said the cyclical nature already, but the um the, the impact that Netflix has been able to have with releasing some of these pieces um is really cool that that's something that they are supporting too. Yeah. X X and X E X I N E X on on X X. YouTube says uh Netflix got me interested in a plant-based diet 13 years ago with a documentary and it was Forks Over Knives. So there you go. And Gruta says the issue with these documentaries is they always get debunked. This is why these documentaries are not good for veganism. When people find out that it's propaganda, especially when it comes to health. See, I, I completely disagree with you here, Garuda. Um, you know, of course, like every documentary, there are things that get sensationalized. And that's just seems to be across the board around every single documentary because there's they they are they do have a motive, right? There's there's some sort of story they're trying to tell and they're trying to sensationalize things. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I think that they are not bad for the vegan movement at all. Um, they do give some fodder sometimes to the opposition, but you know, I think it's it, in general, it's these have caused way more positive impact than harm. Uh, on to let's run the rest through the rest of these pretty quickly. 2017, what the health inspires a new wave of vegans. Uh, this was just a year after Forks Over Knives, and I think it, I don't know if it inspired a new wave, but it kind of continued to, uh, to drive home the message of a plant based diet and health. Uh, and this says celebrities who tweeted about the film include Neo, Moby, Shay Mitchell, and even Lewis Hamilton. Very, Very cool. cool. Yeah. Um, all right. Also in 2017, Okja, O-K-J-A. Broke I haven't, I haven't even heard of this. I'm very interested in it now. Yeah, yeah. It broke hearts everywhere. Google searches for vegans surged. And this follows the story of a young girl named Mija and a super pig named Okja. A super pig. I don't know what that means. Uh, I don't know. It, it draws comparisons with the real life meat industry. Follows Mija as she fights for Okja to be returned home after he is taken by a giant corporation for the meat industry. Very interesting. Uh, then moving on to 2019, so two years later. The Game Changers proves that meat isn't essential for muscle. And I think that this one is similar to some of the um, some of the other health ones and maybe Cowspiracy. You know, it played it it did something totally new for uh, associating vegans with uh, with athleticism. Um, and I know for a fact that there are two of my friends who have remained vegan because of this film. Um, and that was kind of what pushed them over the edge. So I think the Game Changers was, you know, we're in the plant-based athlete space, of course. No Athlete was was thriving in 2019. Um, so, you know, of course, that kind of imp maybe impacts us a little differently. But I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a, a, a big one for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I, I, I wish there was more, there was more exposure to the Game Changers. I think there was a huge amount, but it's still, it's still such an important story that I think needs to continue to be told. Yeah, um, absolutely. And then 2021, Sea Spiracy. I never actually watched this one. Um, uh, this was yeah, I didn't by the Cowspiracy people 
uh, lifts the veil on industrialized fishing industry. Brands make big changes. Um, so, okay, that's cool. Um, you know, I didn't hear all that many people talking about this one in the same way as the other ones, but if it got uh, some brands to change their practices, that's awesome. And then you have a pretty big gap here, or I guess just two more years, but uh, last year was a big one with uh, Live to 100, Secrets of the Blue Zones. Um, this one, you know, was not a vegan documentary, right? It was, it was, mm -hmm. it was uh, about the blue zones uh, and Dan Butner and his, his work uh, and, and diet is just a part of that, of course. Um, and so I, you know, I think the people, this was another good one, I would say, because, um, because it wasn't just about diet and nutrition. And so people kind of yeah. like hear that as part of a bigger picture thing for, for longevity and living longer. Mm -hmm. I think it was it was a more more relatable, um, ab you know, you're able to apply it to yourself when you see people doing things that are don't feel so extreme. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, you know, the the Blue Zones philosophy and, and his pillars um, are not that radical, right? I mean, it's not like, I mean, I, I think his cookbooks are plant based and Dan Buter might be plant based, but, uh, you know, it's not you have to go 100% plant based. It's not you have to stop drinking all alcohol. It's not that you have to be at the gym for five hours a day. Like they're not that radical and, and they're relatable. And I think that's what's, what's made it so popular. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. And then finally in 2023, Oh no, two more here. Uh, chicken run, the dawn of the nugget. <laughs> we talked about this one about how, um, yeah. about this was a kid's, a kid's movie and whether, and, uh, with a pro, a pro vegan agenda, uh, because it exposed uh, the factory farms for chicken factory farms um, and and how it felt like a big one. But I don't know that it actually made much of a, a, spl a splash in the in changing people's uh, perception of chicken nuggets. But, uh, you yeah, know, maybe. Maybe it's kind of just like indoctrinating kids a little bit here and there. I'm okay with it. I actually haven't seen it. Maybe, yeah. I'll watch it with my kids. Um, finally, you are what you eat. The twin experiment, you know, Matt and I have talked a lot about this one. Uh, we like the experiment a lot. We like, of course, the results a lot. Uh, we have some issues with the way the the film portrayed a plant based diet and and the motives behind the film, and uh, and that kind of I think clouded a lot of the the positive things that could have come from this film um, or this mini series, I guess. And, you know, I mean, people watched it. I heard several people kind of mention it to me offhand, which is, which is great. But, um, you know, I, I kind of wish they had, they had toned down the agenda a little bit. I think it would have been more impactful to actually just look at, at the results and, uh, instead of kind of trying to push something, but I don't know. That was my take. Did you watch it? No, I haven't. I haven't seen it, but now I want to, cause I know I'm interested in the studies that they're doing. Yeah. I haven't seen it. Um, all right, let's see. We got a couple comments here. Lady Draws a Lot says, Sea Spiracy is a must see. All right, gotta check it out then. Mm -hmm. Um, big meaty X Claws, his documentaries were, uh, let's see, Game Changers, You Are What You Eat, How to Live to Be 100. Did it for me this year. Yep, yep. awesome. <laughs> And then Gruda still pushing the, uh, still pushing the propaganda. <laughs> no, uh, no. And you're right, Gruda. Blue Zone diets. I don't know if they're all non-vegan. I thought that. Um, I think there's a couple uh, that are vegan. That, uh, the one here, La Melinda. I believe that one's vegan, um, but the other ones are not. And that's you know, and but there's you know, there's there's no hiding that. No one is uh, claiming that they are. Um. All right, so that is it for the show. Matt O'Connor says he highly recommends the Blue Zones documentary. Very well done. Uh, agree there. Um, that's it for the Definitely. show. Thanks, Isabel, for filling in for Matt. Matt will be back tomorrow. Um, but you will be back on Friday. So Yes, indeed. Maybe, maybe uh, you know, I had a kid here last Friday for the episode. Maybe maybe this Friday there'll be a kid free episode. Thanks everybody. <laughs> let's let's certainly hope so. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. We'll we'll, we'll see you tomorrow.